Let's get on to our next session. Really excellent panel for this. It's called Building a Strong Alliance to Advance Purpose. It's brought to you in partnership with APCO, and we thank you for that. Welcome to the stage, please, Marlo Gahl, who's Chief Talent Officer and Chief Diversity Officer at Aerial Investments. Christina Schiarino, VP of Communications at Aerial Investments. And our moderator, Brandon Neal, who's Senior Director, Political Strategist, North America at APCO Worldwide. Please welcome them to the stage. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, come on. Good afternoon. All right. All right. All right. Well, I am excited to be here. Thank you guys for joining us today. And I pardon to have some of my back towards uh, to you, but I'll do my best to, to stay engaged. Uh, so, many, so good to see so many smiling faces. Uh, we are excited as we are here today to talk about building a strong alliance to advance purpose and talking specifically about the two intersections of DEI, also communications and uh, human resources, actually three uh, parts as well. And joining me today are two experts that we have joining us on this panel today uh, from Aerial Investments. We have uh, Ms. Marlo Gall, who is the Chief Talent Officer and Chief Diversity Officer at Aerial Investment. And we also have Christina Serino, who is VP of Communication at Aerial Investment as well too. Now, full disclosure, the founder and chair of Aerial Investments is my big brother and a mentor of mine. So I will do my best to be, of, uh, be objective as possible. But it's a wonderful organization founded in 1983, and it is uh, an independent money management firm. And next year, you guys will turn 40 years old. Unbelievable. It's a big deal. It's a big you-know-what deal. <laughs> Aerial is the first African-American-owned asset management firm in the country. Uh, the firm offers mutual funds and nine separate account strategies as well. So we're going to dive right into it. And before we do, though, I want quickly, since we have two talented people who are here on the stage, to tell us about your journey quickly and how'd you get here. Sure, I'm happy to start. Yeah. I'm Christina Sherino. I um, serve as the day-to-day -day lead of our communications team at Ariel, alongside our chief communications officer. I joined Ariel mid-pandemic, so December 2020, virtually. I was living in Santa Barbara at the time, um, and I got a call from our now chief communications officer, who I worked with on the agency side. I come from Weber Shanwick, where I sat on the crisis communications team for many years, and she said, I'm going to Ariel. Will you come with me? Um, I was lucky enough that Melody Hobson, our co-CEO, was also in Santa Barbara at the time, um, hibernating. So. I had a masked outdoor meeting with her that definitely convinced me that that was the place that I needed to be. Um, so when I joined Ariel, our mission was to really stand up an integrated communications function at the firm and bring together previously distinct groups into one communications umbrella. So that encompasses marketing and brand, media and thought leadership, as well as community affairs. Awesome. Um, hi, everybody. Great to see you all. Um, I joined Ariel in March of 2020, and um, when I first started interviewing, I was still with Groupon in 2019 in November or so, and you know, by the time start date began, it was the world was turned upside down. So I <clears throat> remember vividly that Friday was March 13th. We were in Colombia for my birthday. And this is when things were going insane. Like, we're closing the borders. If you're not back in the US, you know, by daybreak, good luck, right? So we scrambled, we get home. I show up at Ariel on Monday, and during new hire orientation, they ask, can you write our COVID policy? So of course I said, absolutely. And in my mind, I'm like, okay, we don't even know what COVID is. I haven't met like 10 people yet. It was a crazy, busy, insane time. Um, so let me go back to how I led up to that day. Um, prior to that, as I mentioned, I was with Groupon. Uh, before then, um, I had the, the um, really great privilege to work for Hyatt, uh, spend some time at Office Max, MB Financial Bank, and 
you know, all different industries because I challenge myself. If I'm at a point where I'm going to make a move, it's going to be to learn something new and different. And that's the great thing about HR. It's so malleable. You can go anywhere. People need people. So it's been really easy um, in that regard. When I got the call for Ariel in full transparency, um, the recruiter did not let me know it was Ariel. She told me it was asset management, and I was like, snooze fest. <laughs> like, I'm probably not your person. I suck at numbers. This is not going to be fun. So after a few calls, she told me, by the way, the firm is Ariel Investments. And I'm like, why didn't you lead with that? <laughs> right? Like, if, if you don't know Ariel or Melody or John, um, I, I'm convinced you have to be living under a rock. But, you know, beyond um, what they do, I mean, I'm from Chicago, so I've grown up with them, if you will, so it's not new to me. But I took pause because it would be the very first time in my career that I would have a black boss in my entire career. The very first time in my career that in my organization, the top three leaders are all people of color, two of them are women. So of course I said, hell yeah, <laughs> right? Um, and more compelling was the opportunity to really build a full on talent management function. You know, obviously Ariel was doing something right. We're almost 40 years in the game, you know, first African-American led firm um, to be successful and, and make it this far and, and keep going. Um, but it was time for a change, right? So how do we move from HR to full on talent management? So after having a few conversations with your mentor, John and Melody and the entire leadership team, um, I said yes, they were still interested and almost three years later, we're here now. That is awesome. And it's also interesting to see that you guys are both pandemic babies, right? Yes. That started in the pandemic, <laughs> and we're still here. Uh, question, so why is collaboration, uh, we have HR and communication, why is collaboration between HR and communication critical, especially when it comes to advancing purpose? Mm -hmm. And I'll throw it out to both of you guys. Yeah. You know, I think at a high level, um, you know, anything internally or externally as it relates to your people, which are where everything happens, um, is critical. And oftentimes these big things are high stakes and really sensitive. So you have to partner with experts who help you navigate the what, the how, and most importantly, the why. Particularly during change, people feel like they're lost, they're not included, they don't feel a sense of belonging. So, you know, I've always partnered with my comms folks wherever I've been because I understand how important it is to get alignment right the first time. You know, you get your, your first time to make a really great impression. And if that message is missed, you risk losing confidence, you miss losing um, engagement, right? And most importantly, you risk losing trust. So, I mean, I think those are three really big reasons why it's so essential to partner with your comms experts. I think especially as it relates to the topic of diversity, equity, and inclusion, HR and comms have a huge opportunity to really connect the dots for employees on why diversity matters, why it's actually material to business outcomes. I think one of the biggest mistakes that we make as communications practitioners when talking about this is communicating the what, the data, we're X percent diverse, whatever it is, but not the why. And that's, that's the missing piece in so many cases. Um, we actually have data that shows that there's a pretty big disconnect when it comes to the average US worker and the leadership team at a company. So we surveyed US workers across the country as well as Fortune 500 directors who attend our Black Corporate Directors Conference every year. Um, and we found that the directors believe that their company is acting out of concern for employees, concern for social inequality, um, in the interest of shareholders. They really believe DEI is critical to a company's success. But when you ask the average worker, they say, I think my company is just acting for public relations reasons yeah. um, or political concerns. So without that adequate understanding of of purpose and why you're advancing this purpose, they're not gonna be working to advance it on your behalf. 
You mentioned, thank you both, you, been, you mentioned the conference, the director's conference, which is awesome, by the way. Um, uh, communication is key, right? How do you create a culture, right, within your organization with so many different diverse backgrounds, with so many different people, so many people who may believe in this? I mean, some people don't. That's their personal opinion. But you still have got to bring these two things together. So how do you create that culture within your organization? Sure. Um, so you have to be rooted in something, right? So we have what we call our core values and we also have aerial behaviors. So you know how you show up, how you don't show up. We embed those things in every step of the employee experience. We hire to these things, right? So we have interview loops where our leaders are engaged in the interview process and they assess talent based on our core values and also our behaviors in addition to obviously the, the technical skills. Um, we create um, leadership opportunities, right? We have an emerging leaders program and it's fully rooted in these behaviors, right? So it's not just like what these people are doing, right? It's also how they do the work. And then again, that ties back to how we define our core behaviors or our, our core values and our aerial behaviors. Um, most importantly, it starts at the top. You know, for us, we're lean and mean. People think Ariel is like humongous. Like on our best day, we're 120 strong, mm -hmm. right? But um, we're lean and mean, and we have to be efficient, and we have to have collaboration and teamwork, or it won't work. So I think John and Melody give an amazing demonstration of that as co-CEOs. You know, a lot of times there's a whole lot of ego in the room, you know, a whole lot of, you know, self-important agendas, I have to say, they are two of the most humble people I've ever met. They the are. deference they show one <laughs> they another about who needs to lead this, who can follow, yeah. um, is a fantastic modeling for our organization. And you know, one of the competitive advantages I believe we have is it doesn't matter what level you are. It doesn't matter your tenure. They both want people who are there to perform and who are engaged in making sure our core values stay intact and committed to demonstrating those behaviors that define who Ariel is. So, you know, if you're fortunate enough to join the team, you can expect a, a phone call directly from Melody or John at any point. I find that right. so fascinating. So the history behind this as well, too, when John founded the company, Mel was an intern yeah. and that she ended up working for him, and he really, really uh, liked her work ethic and really, really connected. So when it talks about mentoring and talk about a connection, it was very organic. And I know a lot of times people, uh, they want to shoot to the top. And they ask, people ask me, you know, all the time in terms of, well, what do I need to do? Let your work, and I say, say this, let your work speak for itself. Do the work, you know, do the work. Um, mentoring is very important. And you talk about working together so you don't work together in silos. Uh, at at uh, APCO, at uh, Ariel, and we don't do that at APCO either, but uh, we work collaboratively. Talk about your mentors. Do you have mentors? Do you men mentor uh, individuals, Christina, at the office? Yeah, so I think mentors are so important, and I think it's, it's great to have many. Not, a, not every person can be one thing for you. Um, someone who I've learned a lot from in this space and who... Um, our firm partners quite closely with is Stephanie Creary. She's an academic at Wharton who is really focused on operationalizing DE&I in boardrooms specifically. So she's created an incredible framework for, great, you have a more diverse board, now what? She has very specific action steps for actually advancing progress, such as which committee does a diverse board member belong on? How do you create a culture that embraces that? Um, so she's someone who I really admire and who we partner with a lot at the firm, who I recommend looking into her research on this. Awesome. You mentioned uh, DEI. Obviously, that's the, 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 the topic. And a lot of companies stepped up in 2020 uh, in light of what was happening in the country. And a lot of people made, a company made verbal um, pledges. And Full disclosure, uh, the Floyd family was a client of yours truly, so we started the George Floyd Foundation uh, and worked directly with George Floyd's family, uh, his sister, his brother, uh, and, and, and the entire board, and we raised money. That was, that was, that was really um, the, the impetus of the, of the organization. So I saw the pledges come in and raised a lot of money, but then you saw a lot of people who verbally pledged, right, but didn't follow through, and then 2021 came. And then now it's 2022. Okay. And, you know, I'm old school, right? So I'm like, hey, 
Where's the money, right? Uh, you can't say that. That's a joke, guys. Laugh. <laughs> you can't say that. But what do you say to organizations who made that verbal pledge but did not follow up? And then how do you, how do you follow up? Because there are companies that said we want to do the right thing, and politically they checked the box. But, you know, when it came down to morally, they didn't follow up. So what would you say to those companies, and, and, and how do you follow up? Let's start with Christina and then go to, to Marla. Mm-hmm. I think you're right. There were a lot of announcements and pronouncements. Um, There were a lot of press releases issued in the spring of 2020. Um, And I think we're definitely going to see external stakeholders coming for the receipts, as the kids say. Um, You know, media cares. I talk about this all the time with reporter contacts. We saw those press releases. We saw those announcements. In some cases, we saw clear targets, which is great, specifics. But we haven't heard a lot since from some companies. And I think that's a story. I mean, investors care, certainly. You're seeing things like um, NASDAQ recently announced its board disclosure rule in which um, they're requiring every one of the 3,000 something companies listed on their exchange to publicly report if they have less than two diverse directors and then explain why to investors um, and create a plan for remedying that. And then you have investors like Ariel who have taken a very concrete stance on this. Um, you know, in 2020, I think it was, we um, adjusted our proxy voting policy to um, be that we would actually vote against committee chairs of boards that lack racial or ethnic diversity. So I think, in short, it's coming. Um, it's going to continue. And, and external stakeholders, as well as internal stakeholders, I think, are waiting for the follow through. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think, you know, from a talent standpoint, um, we're in a period now where, you know, people are rethinking and reassessing how they spend their time, including at work, how they work, et cetera. And that psychological safety, and I can trust what you tell me. I have confidence um, that, you know, what you're saying is gonna, you know, be fully threaded, is heightened more than ever. Um, You know, we call it the the great resignation now, but years ago it was the war on talent. But I think there is a different nuance because what we all experienced in the murder of George Floyd and all the social unrest, I think, um, is unique, right, than just your standard ebbs and flows of, you know, hiring and staffing. Employees want to know you're going to do what you say you're going to do. So for those companies who are not following through, they should be prepared for a leaky bucket. Yeah. Honestly, you know, it's more than just, you know, on the surface making a proclamation, if you will. Um, employees are far more vocal than ever before about their expectations. And smart employers know that there is a right talent out there right. looking for a place to belong, yeah. looking for a place with psychological safety. And if I can't trust you, I don't have that. It's, just, it's really just that simple. Thank you. You just brought up a key word of belonging. That is a, uh, a catchphrase, a buzzword that we've heard um, this past year. And in 2020, I had a presidential candidate as a client uh, who was all about belonging and, uh, and, and, and bringing people along the way. Um, you, Marlo, as Chief Diversity Officer, you co-lead the Diversity, Equity, and Belonging Committee. Uh, why not diversity, equity, and inclusion? Why is the subtle difference, or well, what's the subtle difference in the language being used? Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's an either or. It's a, it's a both and, mm-hmm. right? I think diversity is the obvious, right? Sometimes not so obvious. It's be above the iceberg, the things we see, and then below the iceberg, the things that are not as obvious. obvious. But it's a metric, right? So it, it's just one piece of the equation. And then you factor in things like inclusion. Um, one of my mentors, when I got into the diversity spaces, you, some of you may know, Tyrone Studemeyer at Hyatt Hotels. Oh, yeah. um, he actually trained and certified me in the space, and he's amazing. But he always says diversity is the mix. Inclusion is making the mix work. And that's part of it, right? So, you know, you're invited to the table, check, check. But mm. once you're here, are you included in the decision making? Is your point of view taken into consideration, right? So beyond that, I think there's this element of belonging. You know, I know when I'm included. I know when I'm not included. But there have been times where I have been included 
but I don't feel a sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. I'm not fully engaged. I'm not fully invested. Right. So if we're going to take things a step further, particularly with things like the great resignation, people need to be fully invested. I mean, we're great investors, but we want our employees to invest in their bosses and invest in our firm for the long haul. You can't do that if you don't feel like you belong on this team. All right. So it's just taking it a step further. All right, appreciate it. Well, thank you. Uh, we, we have a couple of questions from the audience that I'm gonna actually engage. We have uh, a question from an anonymous person. Uh, don't stand up, <laughs> no, an anonymous person. Um, how are you communicating the why around some of the HR DEI initiatives? And I'll start with you, Christina. Sure. Um, so we rely a lot on trusted third-party data sources. Um, McKinsey comes to mind. There's tons of data out there. McKinsey has an incredible stat that we included, I believe, in our SEC comment letter that we issued in support of NASDAQ's diversity disclosure, just plain and simple showing that more diverse teams and more diverse leadership teams on companies lead to a likelihood of higher profits. So that, to me, is key to connecting the dots between, because you can appeal to someone in many ways, right? You can, you can get someone to do something by appealing to their heart. A lot of people do believe that it's just the right thing to do. Um, their head, logic, or their hands, transactional. Ideally, in this case, you don't have to get transactional. Sometimes you do. Some companies are going the route of tying executive pay to progress in this area. Um, but it's that appealing to someone's head and that logic and pulling in trusted third-party data sources that everyone can get behind, um, I think is key, as well as offering them um, high-quality information about your organization. So it's the third-party credibility, but it's also here's very detailed data on the diversity of our organization as a tool for you to go and make the changes you need to make. So we are 70% diverse, not super helpful to a team lead, but here's what your team breakdown is compared to X team and Y team, strategies that they've used to be successful, and let's set a specific target that makes sense for you and a deadline that makes sense for you. Got it. Well, speaking of breakdown, employees in Ariel, 117 total employees, 75% diverse, 67% minority and or woman leaders, ownership, 94.9% .9 owned by employees and board members, and 82.5 minority owned. Wow, that is uh, a, a true exemplar in leadership. Um, what do you say to companies who, or companies and employees who, ref, who are, uh, let me say who refuse, but I know that there are people who may not buy into any of this uh, DEI and belonging messaging, right? Um, for their own personal beliefs. <laughs> and at the end of the day, they're entitled to their own opinion. What do you say to, to those individuals, and how do you, how do you get them on board? Uh, from an HR perspective, and then also from communication, what are the key words to bring them on? Yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if it's about key words. I think it's about being honest and transparent about who you are and your expectations from the start. Um, I mean, again, our firm, it's obvious that we believe in diversity because we live it but it's also embedded in all of our onboarding communications, right? When we talk about the tangents of diversity for us, it's the marketplace, like you know, purchasing and procurement, it's the workplace, obviously our people, and it's also like our social responsibility by way of philanthropy. It is everywhere. So if this is not you know, what you believe in, you can always opt out you know, before the end, right? So I think it's, it's it's so much more sophisticated than keywords. It's what you're communicating and what you're modeling. And we're consistent in that at every stage of the employee experience. Sure. Um, so I think it starts there, and right? And I think those people, if that's what you're into or that's part of your tribe, if you will, you'll gravitate to that right. very easily. And you know, John, you've probably heard John say this all the time, it's not for everybody it's and that's okay. And as far as how I spend my time, I go to where the energy is. Yeah. I go to the like-minded group. I think it's also important to have what John refers to as the contrarian point of view, right? So um, there are people that may have a different point of view for a number of reasons, but it's the learning, sure. right? If you can have a healthy conversation 
Um, there's a growth there, yeah. right? Otherwise, you risk being just another homogenous group. Yeah, well, it's so. good to look through different, a different lens, right, Absolutely. of understanding. Christina? And I think if you can find a way to model it in a way that demonstrates the benefit for that individual, it can be tremendously helpful. So, for example, on our research team, after the financial crisis, we instituted a policy where we had a devil's advocate on every stock. So built into our process is someone who disagrees with you mm -hmm. and pushes you, has a different perspective. And that ultimately helps that stock picker make a better decision. And it's demonstrating for them the value of having diverse perspectives. So making it specific to your organization, to the function of each group, like that's a subtle way that's a little bit different than saying you need more diversity in your team. Like here's actually in practice how it brings you value as an individual. Awesome, thank you. Well, I see, uh, is it almost, is it time to go already? We just got here, guys. <laughs> oh, no. Okay, well, listen, uh, in closing, it's been an honor to, uh, to connect with uh, two of the most talented individuals uh, from Ariel. I know that slow and steady wins the race, right? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, we think, let's give it up for our, our panel again, Ms. Marlo Garp and Christina Sierra. Thank you.